Good evening and welcome to our regular weekly Bible study program. This program is being posted on the 15th of August, 2023. I should be returning from an overseas trip to India on this date. In fact, I might even get in in time to have done this live, but because I will be very exhausted from the trip and suffering jet lag, I thought maybe it's best to just go ahead and pre-record this session like we did last week, the August 8th session. I have three or four questions that I can go through here tonight as a pre-recorded program, um, and that would probably be better for me. Thank you. Uh, like I said, Lord willing, I should be arriving home about the time that, that this is scheduled to be broadcast, but I will be very tired from a long, long journey from India back to the United States and a lot of jet lag from the ten and a half hour time difference. But, as I said, I've had uh, three or four questions that I've got here tonight. May not be able to go a full 45 minutes in answering them, but a couple of them have some fairly lengthy answers. So we'll uh, address them as best we can. But of course, we always start with prayer. Asking the Lord to touch our mind, to understand his word, touch my mind, to be able to explain his word. I would like the Lord to speak through me and out my mouth and make uh, the things of God understandable for those who are watching these Bible study programs. So would you join me in a brief prayer to our Lord here tonight? Our dear righteous God in heaven, we appreciate your greatness, your majesty, the awesomeness of the God that we serve, and the wonderful plan of salvation and the fact that you've included us in that salvation and touched our eyes to see and our ears to hear and opened our understanding and you added us to the body of Christ and for this we will be eternally grateful. Throughout the ceaseless ages we will be thanking you for what you've done to rescue us from the death penalty and from what sin has done in our world and in our lives. We pray that you would touch our minds, touch mine, Lord, that I might be able to understand and explain your word in a way that is beneficial to your people. Touch everyone who's watching these uh, broadcasts that they might receive something from them that is helpful in their Christian walk, that draws them closer to you and prepares them to be a part of the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this in the name of our Lord. Amen. Well, as I said, some of these questions might have a little bit lengthy uh, answer because, well, for example, the first one asked me, would you please explain each of the Ten Commandments? Well, I, I have a very good book. It's called The Institutes of Biblical Law by Rusus John Rushdooney, Rushdooney, and it explains the Ten Commandments in detail. It's a two-volume set of about 1,500 pages or so in length. Uh, and so just from that, you can tell that this is a very deep subject and that there's a lot that could be said about each one of the Ten Commandments. And I won't be able to go through all of the Ten Commandments in that kind of a detail here. That would be fascinating, but it would take many, many hours. So I'll just have to condense a massive subject down into a relatively short answer. The Ten Commandments, which are called the Decalogue, uh, provided the foundation for the Israelite, I didn't say that right, it provided the foundation for the Israelite society. Those Ten Commandments provided a foundation of personal and property rights that are still reflected today in our modern legal system here in America and in much of the world. The Jewish tradition holds that the 613 laws found in the Torah are all summed up in those Ten Commandments. And the Ten can be divided into two primary functions. The first four, maybe five, but probably the first four, deal with our relationship with God that would apply to a vertical relationship up toward heaven as we look up to God. And those first four commandments regulate our relationship with the Lord, with the God of heaven. And the last six, five, probably six of those commandments deal with our relationship with others on a horizontal plane, uh, how we deal with others. And Jesus summed that up uh, when he summarized these two relationships in Matthew 22. Uh, I'll start at verse 35, but read through verse 40. 
It says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus answered him, and said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the first four commandments deal with loving the Lord God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. And the last six of those ten commandments deal with our relationship with others and to love one another as ourself. Uh, and notice how these vertical and horizontal commandments form a cross. Perhaps that's a subtle hint about Jesus. He's the one who kept the law for us. Romans tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that there's none righteous, no, not one. But Jesus was righteous for us. And the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 9 that he wanted to be found in Christ, in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so this perfect cross of vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship uh, is set forth for us in these Ten Commandments. And let's briefly summarize the Ten Commandments. Some call it the Decalogue. Uh, so let's go through the Decalogue. Commandment number one is in Exodus 20 and verse 3. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that's the foundation of monotheism, that there's only one God. Every other society on the face of the earth at that time, when the Exodus occurred, they believed in a multiplicity of gods and goddesses. There were storm gods and fertility goddesses, etc., etc. And Israel was the only people on earth to have only one God. And he was the only God to be worshipped. See, idolatry is worshipping anything more than your worship and submission to that one God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment 2 is in Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So essentially that's a commandment that you not make any kind of an image and worship it. Don't grave, engrave an image. Don't uh, carve one out of wood. Don't grave one out of metal. Don't melt down and and pour into a mold and create a statue of, of some beast or some godlike figure that somehow you think that you're supposed to bow down and worship. Uh, it forbids making natural objects of worship. In fact, we still will not bow down to a statue of Jesus or a statue or an image of any god or any angel. Idols that are made of wood or stone or metal are not to be worshipped. Then there's the third commandment in Exodus 20 and verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now that means more than just don't cuss. We are never to use God in a light or frivolous way. We should never fail to give God the honor that's due to his name. This is also the basis for Solomos swearing before God. If you enter into an oath before God, you cannot break that oath. That would be taking the Lord's name in vain. Um, it's again a showing of our respect and our honor for this great God that we serve. Commandment number four is in Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath 
unto the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor any stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. A day of rest was a blessing and not a restriction. It was a gift God gave to Israel. Every other society in the world worked hard seven days a week just to barely get by. But God gave his people a rest, a day of rest. They were able to be more productive in six days of labor than other people were in seven. So it was a blessing and not a restriction. It wasn't so much that you can't work as it is you didn't have to work. That was a day of rest and not just a day of worship. Some modern people get the idea that the Sabbath should be dedicated to worship and, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But the intent was rest. Well, you're to worship every day. But this day included rest and recreation and pleasant things. And it points to the future when our Lord returns to establish his millennial kingdom. Humanity has had about 6,000 years of labor on this earth. But the next 1,000 year day is the Lord's Sabbath and it will be a pleasant time. When the writer of Hebrews was talking about that coming millennial kingdom, he wrote in Hebrews 4 and verse 9 that there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now these four commandments were probably written on one of the two tablets of stone that Moses carried down from Mount Sinai, and they deal with our relationship with God. The second stone, remember there were two, probably had the remaining six commandments that deal with our relationship with other people. The vertical relationship with God is those first four commandments. The horizontal relationship with people around us is the last six commandments on that second stone. And so we get to commandment number five in Exodus 20 and verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And this establishes a principle of honoring all authority. Children, even adult children, are to honor their parents. And they are to respect those who gave them life. And in a greater sense, we are to honor anyone in authority over us, whether it be the boss on the job, the policeman on the beat, the pastor in the church, and especially for children, their parents. Commandment 6 in Exodus 20 verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, that's a King James translation. It would be better translated, Thou shalt not commit murder. Because you could kill. You could kill sacrifices. You could kill animals to eat. You could kill venomous snakes, and you could kill enemy soldiers in battle. But you cannot murder the innocent. That's the commandment. This commandment rules out killing with malice. And you can't even kill somebody's reputation. You can't kill their influence. You are to be a peacemaker. You should not ever have murder in your heart. Thou shalt do no murder. Number seven is in verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, the sanctity of marriage is supposed to be upheld. You cannot have a sexual relationship with anyone other than your married spouse. Jesus said even thinking of it can be sin. Uh, and you have to stay pure from sexual impurities. And sadly, in our current world, it seems like there is a, a flood of, of immorality of all sorts, the LGBTQ, the, the rampant divorce rate, these infidelities that found in marriage, uh, uh, the premarital sex, there's just so much that violates this seventh commandment. But I don't believe God has changed his mind. He's not that kind of a God. He doesn't change. And if he was against fornication and adultery when he gave the Ten Commandments, they still apply to us today. Commandment 8 is in verse 15, Thou shalt not steal. 
That means no shoplifting, no burglary, no picking of pockets, no defrauding of anyone out of what belongs to them. Don't steal office supplies. Don't steal anything that's not rightfully yours. Don't steal credit that you didn't earn. Don't steal someone else's uh, goals and ambitions and claim them as your own. Don't steal their successes as your own. Uh, so much, like I say, could be said about every one of these Ten Commandments. I could just go on and on, but I do want to get through this. So verse 16 has the Ninth Commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You see, truthfulness is a hallmark of a child of God. So don't make statements that hurt your neighbors. Don't uh, make innuendos. Don't engage in character assassination. Don't whisper falsehoods. Uh, whisper separateth the chief friends. I mean, there's so many scriptures we could use. But make sure you're telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what a child of God should do. And then you get to the 10th commandment in verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. See, all the prior commandments dealt with acts, things that you did. This one, number 10, deals with your thoughts. You can sin with your mind, even if you don't do anything. And to covet something means more than just wanting, I wish I had that, I wish I had that car that my neighbor has. He's got a nice uh, $70,000 car. I wish I had a car like that. That's, that's not necessarily coveting. But coveting goes beyond that mere want and crosses the line into envy and into lust and even into scheming to attain something that God hasn't given you. And so I realize this is a very brief overview. I'm sure we could have delved very deeply into each of these commandments, but I hope this addresses the question that was sent to me that to go through the Ten Commandments. And yes, I do believe these Ten Commandments are a guide pole, a, a way to live our life. I'm not saying you can become righteous by keeping them. We depend on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But he also said, Jesus did, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And being Christ-like and reflecting Christ to a, to a dying world would be best done by living a life in conformity with the commandments of God. All right, this next question says, what does artificial intelligence, or AI, mean for us as we head into the future? Are there dangers that we should be aware of? Now, I wrote an article about the dangers of artificial intelligence in the current issue of our quarterly magazine, The Gospel of Peace. We publish this and we mail it out four times a year. We can only mail it to U.S. addresses. Overseas gets very expensive, but we do try to put the issues on our website, which is dmgac.org. It's the abbreviations for Des Moines Gospel Assembly Church, dmgac, and it's .org, or organization, rather than com, uh, .com. It's a .org, dmgac.org. And on that uh, website, you can even subscribe to this quarterly magazine. But one of the most amazing developments in our modern time is the tremendous advancement in artificial intelligence. AI is a branch of computer science that is designed to understand and, and store human intelligence, to mimic human capabilities, to be able to do things like complete tasks and process human language and even recognize speech. Um, it's thinking almost like a human. It's an artificial human mind. Now for decades, artificial intelligence has been advancing at, at breakneck speed. Today, computers can fly airplanes. They can interpret x-rays and, and EKGs and other data. It can sift through forensic evidence uh, there's algorithms that can paint masterpiece artworks and compose symphonies in the style of Bach or Beethoven. And Google is developing uh, artificial moral reasoning 
so that these driverless cars they're inventing can make decisions about potential accidents. If I can only go this way or that way, which way is going to cause less damage? Which way would have the greater potential to, to protect lives? Uh, value judgments, all of that. And this, this AI, artificial intelligence, uses a network uh, that is uh, uh, you know, more of a quantum type computing rather than the linear computing of O's and 1's that we're used to from computer programs going all the way back to the 70's. But a neural network processes information similar to the way a human brain does the way the human brain learns information and processes it. And those neural networks enable artificial intelligence to learn from experience, much like a human does. Um, far beyond the, the robots of science fiction that we encountered 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago on the movies. Um, some of the experts who developed these AI chat boxes. You've heard of chat bots. Uh, some of the experts that developed them are even alarmed at the scary implications of this rapid development of AI. Because chat boxes, or not boxes, chat bots, C-H-A-T-B-O-T-S, chat bots, could overtake the level that a human brain can hold. They could hold more information and process it faster than even a human brain. And that could be scary. The pace of this acceleration has surprised people. Even the creators of AI are shocked at how fast it's progressed. Some have even called that danger, and I'll quote, quite scary, close quote. Why is it scary? Because AI's decision-making and learning capabilities could lead to a situation where the machines are controlling humans instead of the humans controlling the machines. That is scary. I know that sounds like science fiction, but in reality it could become science fact. And recently, more than a thousand technology researchers and leaders, including Apple's co-founder Steve Wozniak, have urged intelligence labs to pause the development of advanced AI systems. They wrote a letter and said that AI tools present profound risks to humanity and society. Profound risks. More than a thousand technology experts signed that letter. That AI technology is often used to collect and analyze huge amounts of personal data, which raises questions about how private your data really is, how secure it is. AI can make use of your voice, make use of your picture, make use of anything you've written uh, on Facebook or any search engine, anything you've looked at on the World Wide Web. All of that could be easily stolen by AI technology. And as it's becoming more and more sophisticated, the security risks associated with the use and the misuse of AI is increasing rapidly. Hackers and, and people who have evil intent can use the power of AI to develop advanced cyber attacks, to bypass all of your, your security protocols, and exploit any vulnerabilities in your system. AI weaponry, which can function all on its own. You don't have to control it once you start it. Um, it raises dangers of rogue states or, or terrorist organizations using technology. Um, and they don't even have to be involved in human control. Let the AI programs uh, launch attacks, either using weapons or just attacking computer systems, taking down power grids, uh, firing missiles that were not intended to be fired or, or deliberately sending missiles where no one intended for them to go. It's a scary scenario. And then there's content that they call deep fakes. 
which spreads false information that's created by AI can create all kind of false information. Um, that can be used to manipulate public opinion, make people afraid of things that aren't real, uh, convince them to do things. A deep fake is a video or a photograph of a person in which their face or their body has been digitally altered so that they appear to be someone else. And you can do that to maliciously spread false information. Uh, you can take a picture of somebody who, who's as honest as the day is long and create a video of them robbing a bank or involved in adultery and fornication, immorality of all sorts, deep fake images of uh, people doing drugs when they've never done that. Uh, somebody not too long ago published a deep fake uh, photograph of Donald Trump hugging uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, Donald Trump does not like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Fauci probably does not like Donald Trump. I'm sure they've never hugged one another. But there's a picture of them doing it. It's a fake, but it's a deep fake. And the people are starting to use that for what they call sextortion. Extortion uh, involving sex. Uh, that is, they'll have a picture of you involved in fornication and say, unless you pay us so much money, we'll publish these pictures and destroy your reputation, destroy your marriage, destroy your family, your home, whatever. The number of nationally reported sextortion cases increased 322% between February 2022 and February 2023. That's according to the FBI. Innocent pictures or videos that have been uploaded to, to Facebook or other social media pages or messages that were sent online can be twisted into sexually explicit AI images that look real, they look true to life, and it's almost impossible to prove that they're a fake. And so is that a threat to the body of Christ? Yes, because AI could be weaponized by malicious adversaries to attack the church and its leaders. Cyber attacks can destroy the church computer systems, can even get into the modern heating and air conditioning and ventilation systems and shut them down drain bank accounts, lock up the computer so you can't even access your own accounts, uh, gain access to confidential information, copies of letters that were that were typed using Word or some other program and stored on your computers. And some of that can be confidential. And then there's the deep fakes that are so hard to recognize as fakes. They could be used to destroy the credibility and the reputation of innocent ministers and saints. Their written words, their spoken words, could be altered to say things that the real person never said. And pictures could be changed to be showing them doing things that they've never done. And perhaps we're slow to realize that threat, but it's real. And only the, tr well, only the Lord can protect us. That's the only fail-safe protection. It says in Psalms 127 and verse 1, Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. And except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now AI is not only a threat, but perhaps it could even be a benefit to the body of Christ. I mean, technology has been advancing for centuries. The invention of the printing press turned out to be a real benefit to Christianity. Yes, the printing press could be used to print attacks and falsehoods, but it could also be used to print Bibles. Radio and television and the internet, they were all dangerous to the faith, but they were also tools that could be harnessed to promote the faith. Artificial intelligence is a tool, and perhaps in time we can find ways that we can use that tool to benefit the body of Christ. We certainly can't stop it. We cannot stop progress, but we can educate our saints to be aware of the dangers, be aware of the risks, and we might be able to harness that tool and use it in some fashion in the future for the greater glory of God. I certainly hope so. My next question asks, can you elaborate on the difference between a presumptuous sin and someone who is struggling in sin? 
For example, someone who may have an addiction to smoking or drugs or alcohol, etc. If someone can't break that addiction, is that a presumptuous sin? Knowing things are sin and struggling to overcome them, but failing at times, is that presumptuous? What makes a presumptuous sin different from just a mistake? And how many mistakes can we make before it becomes a presumptuous sin? And we talk about the Lord's mercy and His grace, His forgiveness, but when do these things run out and judgment steps in? Well, it's a mouthful or a question, but it's a good question, and I want to try to give it a, a good biblical and honest answer. But the question is about addiction, the habitual practicing of things that are sinful, like drug abuse, etc. And yes, the Bible does condemn those who sin presumptuously. We read, it, read in Numbers 19, no, let's go to Psalms 19, I'm sorry, Psalms 19, 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And then in Numbers, chapter 15, verse 30 says, But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So, a presumptuous sin is a bad thing. And the Hebrew words translated as presumptuously in Numbers literally means with a high hand. It means to sin in an insolent and haughty and bold and, and heedless, deliberate manner. It means you know what you're doing was wrong and you don't care. You're just going to do it anyway. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what God says. So what? I like doing it. I'm going to do it. Um, I believe a presumptuous sin is one that's committed with no remorse, no guilt, and certainly no repentance afterwards. Now I know addictions are exceedingly hard to break. The human brain becomes almost hardwired for the pleasure that addiction brings. And the brain demands that you continue in that addictive behavior. And forming a brand new neural pathway and destroying that old habitual sinful thought pattern is very hard. It takes time, it takes a lot of effort, and for many it takes the supernatural help of the Lord. And I don't condone sin. I'm not making any excuse for sin. I believe that wrongful, sinful addictions must be resisted, they must be broken, and they must be forever forsaken. But I also know that our God is merciful. I know that Jesus bore all the punishment for all of our sins on his cross, and that we, the redeemed, blood-bought, spirit-filled children of God, never have to receive punishment for our sins. Our loving Heavenly Father may chasten us, chastise us, he may chasten us, but he will never punish us. There's a difference between chastisement and punishment. My Father chastised me to make me a better son. He never punished me because he just hated me or he was angry. Um, see, our Father in heaven chastens us like sons, but he never punishes his own children. Why? Because we don't stand before him in our own righteousness. Rather, we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And God cannot punish someone who has the righteousness of Jesus. Our righteousness has been imputed to us by Holy Ghost baptism. We read in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. See, we can't depend on our righteousnesses. That's filthy rags in God's eyesight because we can't get good enough to keep all the law. We'll break some of the commandments. We can never get fully clean. We're always in dirty garments unless we put on the fine linen, clean and white, that is the righteousness of Jesus. It says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
but we're justified by the blood of Jesus. We read in Romans 5 and verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And Paul wrote in Philippians 3, 9 that he wanted to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. So, in answer to the question, I don't think a bad habit or a sinful addiction is a presumptuous sin. It is sin. And there has to be genuine remorse and repentance, but there's also forgiveness in Christ. And you should be working to break that habit, working with all your might, whatever it takes. But if you're truly repentant over it, then it's not presumptuous. It doesn't rise to that level. 1 John 1 and verse 9, the Apostle John said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's because we have an advocate, Jesus Christ. He's on our side. Um, John continued in chapter 2 and verse 1, 1 John 2, 1. He said, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Just don't ever cross the line into presumptuousness where you're saying, I don't care. I'm going to do it. It's fun. I enjoy it. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what God thinks. Bless God, I'm going to go ahead and do it. That becomes presumptuous. When you say, I've tried and I've failed again, Lord. Would you forgive me? I'm going to keep trying to break this habit. I'm going to keep striving. I'll never stop trying. But if you'll help me, if you'll forgive me for the mistakes I've made, I'm going to keep working on this, and I'm going to break this horrible addiction. I know the Lord will love you and forgive you. He may chasten you to help you break that habit, but I know he will get you through it. So that's all the questions I have at this point. And we'll close this session. Hopefully next week uh, I will be able to do this live and address even live questions that are submitted during the broadcast. But until then, if you have Bible questions, please go ahead and send them in as a comment to this Facebook page or as a message to our Facebook uh, account. And we'll do our best to address those questions in a timely manner and look into the Word of God. We want to understand what the Lord is saying to us in his holy word. So thank you so much for your attention, and may the Lord bless you. Amen.